Prior to the Second World War, high-altitude fighter development was a largely secondary issue for most air forces. The premier fighters of the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire Mark I and the BF-109E, both exemplified this. But in the months to come, higher-flying reconnaissance aircraft and bombers needed high-altitude interceptors to deal with them. In this role, the Luftwaffe would employ the BF-109E-7Z, which was similar to earlier variants but used a nitrous boost system, which delivered oxygen to the engine once the aircraft rose beyond the altitude its supercharger could maintain combat power. This closely guarded system, known as GM-1 or Göring Mixture 1, would prove effective and became an essential piece of equipment for Germany's high-altitude fighter and reconnaissance programs for much of the war. It wasn't long until the BF-109E became obsolete and was replaced by the initially very troubled F-Series. However, after a painful teething period, the new nitrous-boosted BF-109F-4Zs would serve on every front with considerable success, though access to GM-1 could be problematic across the Mediterranean and on the Eastern Front. With its success, many hopes were placed on its successor. The new DB605A engine on the new G or Gustav series was extremely promising, boasting a higher output and more powerful supercharger. With it, a new high altitude model and standard fighter were produced. Along with the new engine, the Gustav series brought with it a series of improvements to its armor, instrumentation, and also a new series of standardized modular equipment kits which could represent anything from bomb racks to photographs equipment. However, these initial models brought little improvement as they were soon prohibited from running at their highest power settings. Brutal teething issues stemming from the mismanagement and the use of poor quality but widely available materials would plague the new DB605A for years. Of the two new fighters, the BF-109G-1 was the specialized high-altitude model, which would include both the ability to carry the GM-1 system and a pressurized cockpit. The cockpit pressurization allowed for a pilot to remain at extremely high altitudes without encountering any of the discomfort one would otherwise experience. Without the aches, pains, and numbness, the pilot was far less likely to become fatigued after long flights at extreme altitudes. The cockpit pressurization system was rudimentary and was kept pressurized by a compressor which drew from a small scoop left and forward of the pilot. The GM-1 system too was improved, being made modular and paired with a set of fuselage racks which allowed for the fitting of a reconnaissance camera. The first of these aircraft were built in May of 1942 at the Erla plant and were subsequently handed off for testing and familiarization with Luftwaffe crews. These planes were then used by the 11th Staffel of JG-2, noted as their high altitude unit, and began operations on July 17th. The unit was first based in St. Paul in the Netherlands and would be assigned to the area before later being redeployed to Germany, and then to the Mediterranean in November before they were then transferred to JG-53 before the end of the year. JG-5 also received a number of the planes some weeks after JG-2, the unit being assigned to various bases in Western Europe until the end of the war. In service, the aircraft performed well and the pressurized canopy was well regarded. Curiously enough, the aircraft were not reserved exclusively for high altitude use and were instead used much like the standard version of the fighter. Their use as high altitude interceptors was more typical of the Western European squadrons, which had the benefit of better access to GM-1. In spite of the debacle of getting the DB605A into service, improvements were slowly being made. Chrome-plated exhaust valves added much-needed durability and corrosion resistance, and a series of improvements to oil circulation would fix most of the engine's most serious problems. The restrictions would finally be released by the autumn of 1943, over a year after the aircraft first entered service. At the beginning of the year, the BF-109G-3 had superseded its predecessor on the production line. 
The aircraft's largest difference, apart from its engine improvements, were its larger tires. Small bulges were added to the top of the wing to accommodate the enlarged landing gear, and the larger tailwheel was now non-retractable, contributing a considerable amount of drag. These changes were made to give the aircraft better ground handling and allow it to better operate out of rough airfields on the Eastern Front and the Mediterranean. Unlike the previous model, the G-3 saw increasing use against USAAF daylight bombing raids. These had started small in late 1942, often against targets nearest England. By the summer of 1943, the raids had escalated continuously and were increasingly focused on targets within Germany. In addition to the typical daylight squadrons, several BF-109 G-3s and later more heavily armed G-5s were passed on to the single-engine night fighter unit JG-300 and its sister squadrons 301 and 302, NJG-11 and the 10th Night Combat Group. Originally formed as an experimental unit, JG-300 was meant to test the suitability of single-engine fighters for night interception use. The initial premise of the unit was to engage RAF bombers over their targets, where the light of fires and searchlights would make the planes more visible against the ground and cloud cover, and thus enable interception without the use of ground control and onboard radar systems. The group was expanded upon, with the 301st and 302nd squadrons being established. While the hope of transitioning daytime fighter squadrons to night was deemed infeasible due to the amount of training required, the combined unit would continue its task. Carrying out the interceptions over raided cities was an exceptionally dangerous one, as they shared the space with flak units and a growing number of enemy night fighters. As RAF night fighters began to escalate their intruder missions over Germany, transitioning to and from interception areas became much more dangerous. While the Mosquito night fighters were larger and less nimble than the BF-109, their radar systems allowed them to catch the otherwise blind daylight fighter. In addition to the wild boar tactics, the fighters were also employed in ground-directed interception in order to deal with high-flying Mosquito pathfinders and bombers. Though no Luftwaffe aircraft could effectively catch them until the ME-262B provisional night fighter was introduced. In this role, the single-engine night fighter would be directed into a fixed intercept zone which covered either the approach or departure of the detected enemy aircraft. There, the target would be tracked by the zone's dedicated radar and searchlight units while the fighter would be guided in. This was an exceptionally difficult task owing to the speed of the Mosquito and, without a good starting point of the interceptor, the chases were often fruitless. By the end of 1943, the newest and last iteration of the High Altitude series was in service. The new BF-109 G-5 now carried a pair of 13mm MG-131s in place of its older 7.92mm guns. The heavier guns and the enlarged cowling meant that the aircraft was slower than the one it replaced. These aircraft were distributed to units on all fronts and used much like their standard non pressure pressurized counterparts in addition to their high-altitude roles. However, most were deployed in the strategic air defense of Germany, where they faced a new and very dangerous opponent. The P-51 Mustang appeared to be the solution to American bomber offensive's ills, being a fast, maneuverable fighter with incredible range and high-altitude performance. The danger of this new threat was quickly recognized by one General Major Joseph Schmidt, who began to advocate for the need for GM-1 equipped BF-109s to act as top cover for massed fighter formations. It proved an adequate stopgap, with the nitrous-boosted fighters proving to be more capable of facing the Mustang and Thunderbolt fighters at high altitude. However, as German airspace became contested, boosted fighters caught below 8 kilometers fought at a significant disadvantage, as the system added considerable weight and provided little benefit below that height. In its final evolution, a number of the G-5s used the DB-605AS engine, which had a much larger supercharger designed to improve high-altitude performance. It was a serious improvement, though only a few BF-109 G-5s would ever be equipped with the engine, and most were used as recon aircraft. 
It also came at a loss, as while pilots enjoyed the comfort of the pressurized canopy, it was an expense that Messerschmitt and their directors at the Jägerstab were no longer willing to accept. The Luftwaffe's fortunes, too, declined sharply, as American fighter sweeps periodically attacked airfields once considered safe, and attrition eroded the number of remaining experienced pilots further. Attacks on Germany's synthetic fuel production introduced a final and catastrophic crisis, which largely left the Luftwaffe crippled for the remainder of the war. G5 production was phased out entirely in June of 1944, as Messerschmitt moved to consolidate BF-109 production with the G-14. This would include a high-altitude model using the DB-605AS engine, but without pressurization. It regained some parity with its high-flying allied opponents, though it wasn't until further refinements that the final K-series could truly match them. Its history aside, flying the high-altitude models of the BF-109G was an experience similar to its standard counterparts, but augmented with systems that boosted its high-altitude performance and comfort. Though not a comprehensively better fighter than its lower-altitude marks, it provided Luftwaffe pilots with a nimble high-altitude fighter capable of chasing down recon planes and holding its own against high-altitude American fighters. As with the standard BF-109G models, the high-altitude fighter was maneuverable, but its increased weight and drag made it more cumbersome than the preceding Friedrich series. Its low-speed maneuverability was made very impressive with the use of leading-edge slats in the wings. However, pilots noted that while aileron and rudder forces were light, the elevator was fairly heavy, an issue which was exacerbated at high speed. Its maximum speed level was decidedly mediocre, though the aircraft boasted a high climb rate and good acceleration. All told, the Gustav series were maneuverable, good handling planes. The cockpit was both cramped and provided poor visibility. The deep-set seat with its heavy cockpit framing greatly restricted the pilot's view, especially towards the forward and rear aspects. It saw some improvement, as a few late-production BF-109G-5s were equipped with the improved Erla factory canopy, as became standard on late war 109s, and provided much better visibility to the sides and rear of the aircraft. The cockpit was among the smallest of any fighter during the time period. Operation of the Gustav was extremely straightforward, given the high level of automation the DB-605A possessed. The engine was controlled through a series of linkages between components which adjusted one another. The supercharger, radiator, propeller, RPM, and mixture were all managed automatically, though manual control was also possible. The core of these linkages was between the propeller RPM and manifold pressure, which was managed through throttle input. Puts. The rest of the engine adjusted itself around this linkage. The GM-1 system consisted of glass wool insulated nitrous bottles, compressed air bottles, and the control system. The GM-1 was kept in a chilled liquid state, which was found to provide a higher boost effect. The chilled nature of the nitrous did, however, bring a drawback in that it leaked as it was warmed and evaporated. An aircraft would need to have its tanks filled immediately before takeoff in order to have the longest duration. The boost could be maintained up to 22 minutes if the tanks were filled immediately before flight, falling to 19 minutes in the winter and 16 in the summer if the aircraft departed 12 hours later. In the summertime, all of the GM-1 could be expended if the aircraft was left parked for two days. The weight of the entire system was considerable, roughly 100 kilograms or more, depending on the specific kit used. At the initial activation height of 8 kilometers, the mixture could boost the top speed of an equipped BF-109 by approximately 30 kilometers per hour and recover as much as 300 PS at high altitude. In conclusion, the high-altitude series of the BF-109G proved to be an effective means of getting a high-altitude fighter into service without having to design a new aircraft or even redesigning Messerschmitt's fighter. It did have drawbacks, but it nevertheless gave fighter and reconnaissance units a plane with respectable high-altitude performance. What are your thoughts on this high-altitude fighter? 
Feel free to share your thoughts on this unique vehicle in the comments section. As always, we here at Plain Encyclopedia appreciate your love and support, so feel free to leave a like and subscribe to know exactly when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us going, visit us on Patreon or via PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.